Acting Chief Superintendent in charge of HR capability planning and staffing. Bit of a mouthful. Um, one of my teams that I have is the recruitment team and you'll see our manager of recruitment here, Sue McDougall, and, and a few members of our recruitment team also. Uh, I'd like to really say thanks very much for coming along today. Um, it's great to see you all here. I'll just run over our brief schedule for, for this afternoon. Uh, and, and firstly, I'd also, I won't introduce everyone now, but you'll see we have some of our uh, illustrious firefighters up there in, in the crowd, we have Eliza up the back, and we also have the twins, uh, George and Hugh. George, of course, is the handsome one, and, uh, yeah, did I get that right? Yeah. Excellent, that's good. And, uh, and we have a number of firefighters out the front here and officers that you'll get to meet throughout the, the next uh, hour and a half. So uh, what we'll run through today is we'll, we'll have a little bit of a discussion about the future for Fire and Rescue New South Wales. We'll also talk about uh, what it takes to be a firefighter and who can be a firefighter. And uh, I would say that uh, who can be a firefighter is, is everyone in this room is possible, you know, for you to be a firefighter. But the, the recruitment processes are challenging and testing and, and not everyone gets through. Not everyone gets through first time, but many get through second, third and fourth attempt. So I wish everyone luck in that process. We'll also talk about the rostering and work arrangements for firefighters. And we'll talk about the recruitment process and the physical aptitude test. Also the medical process and then there'll be some question time at the end. Our, um, our first person to, to come up to the microphone here is uh, Station Officer William Speck. Uh, Bill is a very experienced officer with Fire and Rescue New South Wales and uh, I'm grateful to have him here today. Thanks Brendan. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, my name's Bill Speck. I'm a station officer with Fire and Rescue New South Wales and have been for 34 years, almost 35. Um, I'm going to have a bit of a yarn with you later on but I'd just like to do the acknowledgement to country. So I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the land that we meet on today, the Gadigal people, and pay my respects to elders past and present, and pay all my respects and welcome everybody here today. So I'll have a bit of a yarn in a couple of minutes. Thank you. Fire rescue, can you hear me? Yeah, fire comes, Richard Cup 503, red, sink car and the Yeah. Got the one person there, Mark, and the driver's side. I can see that one person. There we go. You happy? Hey, stay where you are. This truck in here. We'll look after you and we'll get you out of here, okay? You can come in. Mark's coming in to give you a hand, okay? He'll look after you. Just hang in there. Hey, Nat. Dave. Okay. He's got a broken ankle there. Firefighter, he's going to support you in, so just listen to him. We're here to protect what really matters. Been a really brave girl today. Yes. We help anyone, anywhere, anytime. Chin strap on, protects our neck. We are Fire and Rescue New South Wales, and we are prepared for anything. So um, I'll, I'll just briefly touch on my history. I've been in Fire and Rescue New South Wales, or, or originally the New South Wales Fire Brigades, for 27 years. I was a firefighter at King's Cross for around 10 years and a station officer at Redfern for a few years as well. I was a duty commander for Wollongong Metropolitan South 1, and that has 16 fire stations, both retained and, re and permanent, from Kiama to Helensburg. Uh, after that, I, I came back to Sydney. I live in Wollongong, but I came back to Sydney and went for a job at the, the next level, and I've ended up working in head office and, ha and having the three teams that I referred to before. Uh, our organisation's a really broad one, and while we have a lot of frontline staff who are in uniform, many of whom you can see here today and also out in the crowd, uh, we have lots of other specialised areas of the organisation. 
Uh, and recently we developed our, our plus plan, what we call is probably our, our corporate strategy or corporate plan. And just to briefly touch on that, it's a, it's a success model taking us forward. So our act involves us, uh, requires us to be able to do whatever work our skills and equipment uh, allow us to do. And that's very broad, as everyone here today will attest to, is there's no limit to the type of work that we carry out on a day-to-day -day basis. And as you've seen from the video, um, there's fires, of course, but there's many other things that we do. So our, our plus plan is based on uh, being prepared for anything to protect the irreplaceable. We've spent the last 12 months working together across the whole organisation to identify what we want to achieve and what success looks like. Let's go through each part. What does success look like? At the centre of the success model sits the Fire and Rescue New South Wales purpose to protect the irreplaceable. Everything we do, we do to deliver this service to the community. Around this sits those we work with, our people, the community at large, the government and industry. Around this we have our capabilities, starting with our core capability of prevention and education. We will engage closely with our communities to reduce their risk and increase their resilience to fire and emergencies. We will undertake groundbreaking research and benchmark our performance against international standards in injury and property loss prevention. Plus fire. Fire is and will remain a cornerstone in our service delivery. We will ensure a consistent and professional response to fire emergencies across the state adopting new technology and procedures. We will benchmark our performance against international standards in injury, property and environmental loss prevention. Plus rescue. As the state's lead provider of rescue services, we will partner with agencies to ensure communities receive a seamless professional service. We will prepare our firefighters to confidently undertake the rescue incidents that confront them. We will develop success measures and monitor our performance against them. Plus HAZMAT. As the legislated combat agency for hazardous materials, we will be prepared to manage all incidents of accidental or deliberate release that confront us. We will prioritise life, property and the environment in our preparedness and response. We will partner strongly with other agencies to provide the best possible outcomes for communities. We will innovate, evolve and improve our operations to achieve world's best practice. We will establish measures for our performance and look for opportunities to improve our service delivery. We need to continue to focus on these four capabilities to ensure we are delivering these to the highest possible standard. But just doing these well won't be enough. Over the next five years, to successfully adapt to our changing environment and remain a leading emergency service, we will need to expand and improve on our other capabilities. Plus, protect the environment. We will increase our focus and commitment to better environmental outcomes as a consequence of fire and hazmat operations. We will work more closely with other agencies to improve our contribution to better management of environmental impacts as a result of accidental or the deliberate releases. We will put more effort into minimising our own impact on the environment. Plus, counter-terrorism. We will take a more proactive role as a supporting agency looking for opportunities to improve and increase our contribution in both the prevention and response to terrorism events. We will provide high quality advice and support to police as the lead agency in our areas of expertise, hazmat and fire. We will explore and adopt improvements based on international best practice to address the evolving threat and ensure a completely integrated approach. Plus, natural disaster and humanitarian relief. We will work closely with our partners to further develop our ability to deploy international and interstate support to those in need. We will improve our flexibility to provide the Commonwealth options for utilising our capabilities and capacity beyond the rubble in lighter, more agile deployments. We will ensure our firefighters develop and maintain their skills to respond to natural disasters and assist other agencies to do the same. 
plus medical response. We will work with Ambulance New South Wales, who are the lead agency, to increase our capabilities in medical response that recognises our increasing role. We will further develop and support our Community First Responder Program and implement, along with other agencies, the Community Early Access to Defibrillation Program. We will ensure our training is appropriate and realistic and our people are confident in delivering the service. We will ensure we have quality staff support systems in place that reflect the changing role. We have to evolve our culture, how we behave every day, especially towards each other. We have identified the good behaviours that have made us successful, but we have also identified bad and unwanted behaviours that are holding us back. There are some new ones we have to start as well. We are committed to making these changes to our culture for the benefit of our communities and all of our people. Introducing the Fire and Rescue New South Wales Success Model, a model that captures where Fire and Rescue New South Wales will be in five years' time. An agency delivering its core capabilities consistently and sustainably across the organisation. An agency that is prepared for anything to protect the irreplaceable. An agency with a strong, inclusive culture. The plus, sitting at the centre of the model and now in our visual identity, represents our commitment to deliver this and increase our value to the community. The plan for how we will achieve this is our plus plan. Our values are, are something that, that underpin everything we do. Uh, and our values are respect, integrity, service and courage. So anyone here that's been interested for a while in joining the organisation, I'm sure you've been on the websites and you've, you've read that they're, they're key values of our organisation. And, and what we look for through our promotional systems and our day-to-day -day work is that people are committed to those, to those um, values. And, and you know, you'll see things come up through anyone who's been to the interview stage before, you'll see questions that are, that are based around our values as well. So it's important that you're able to display those values on a day-to-day -day basis. Also, the values align with and support the New South Wales Government core values of integrity, trust, service and accountability. So that, that's um, you know, a key aspect of our day-to-day -day work. So what we look for in our candidates um, to be a successful firefighter, you need a wide range of skills, knowledge and attributes. Um, I'm not going to, as you can see up there, I'll give you a, a short time to, to have a look over those. But you'll see that it's important to be able to display personal resilience in everything you do and also an ability to, to, to engage with the public, um, to be intelligent, fit and, uh, and to be a reasonable person that, that other people want to work with. So that's um, something that's critical for us. Also flexibility around work locations. So on the whole, most people who initially join the organisation will start off in a, fire, a busy fire station in the CBD area. That's where most people start. And as time goes on, you'll tend to drift out further to stations closer to your home if you live outside of that CBD area. Um, that's that's the something that's, um, you know, I suppose you can look at in many different ways about uh, how, how flexible we are. We certainly have a rostering system that means that if one of our firefighters is at work, um, they need to be filling a, a position on that appliance until such time as they're replaced by another firefighter because we have a guarantee of service. It's one of the things that makes us different to other organisations. So when when we're called upon, the fire truck will get out the doors with a full crew able to do the job at an emergency incident. So um, that's really important for us. So the first firefighter that I'd like to call to the stage is, uh, is Alison Douglas. And Alison's a senior firefighter at Hurstville Fire Station. Thank you. This has got to come down a tad. <laughs> All right, hi everyone. Uh, yeah, as previously stated, my name is Alison. I am a senior firefighter and I have been with Fire Rescue for nearly 13 years. Um, I've been asked to talk about some of the difficulties of being a fighter and how I have coped with those stresses. For me, the difficulties haven't actually been too prevalent and I think that's due to the fact that we have a really fantastic support network. 
don't get me wrong, I have definitely seen some traumatic, like traumatic things in my career, but honestly, probably the most difficult thing would have to be visualising somebody else in a state of loss, stress or in trauma. Uh, I think possibly even harder than that is visualising somebody else who is there mourning the loss of somebody. Uh, I, I think that's something that is possibly yeah, more difficult to deal with than actually visualising any physical uh, you know, injuries. I've been to, uh, to jobs where it has been very stressful and what I'm really lucky for is that we have that family and team mentality um, that all of us firefighters have and uh, we're there to support one another and we have many avenues for getting help in those stressful situations. My expectations for the job summed up to the reality. My father and uncle were both firefighters so I was really lucky to grow up knowing a lot about what the job actually entailed. I knew that there were some pros and cons, but I also definitely knew that those pros well and truly outweighed those cons. I knew that I wanted to be there to help, this, help support the community that I work for. I wanted a job where I was able to educate the community and I wanted to be there in their time of need. I wanted variety, I wanted to be challenged and I wanted to learn life lessons and I believe that being a firefighter really did help me gain those skills. It's not always glamorous by any means and actually very rarely glamorous. The fire station's our home, we're there, we clean the toilets, we take out the trash and you go to very dis distressing situations. Um, you know, you're put out of your comfort zone on many occasions, but I, I believe it's, it gives you that sort of resilience. As long as you're willing to get your hands dirty, be part of a team and you know, you're willing to put in that effort, the job definitely will not let you down. I like the fact that this isn't just a job, it's a career. There's pathways to progress through the ranks. So you'll start the college, you'll be a probationary firefighter. After three months, you will then graduate and you'll become a firefighter. And then that's when you will go out to your stations. Uh, at that point, you will do more uh, modules, you'll do some assessments and some learning, and then you can be promoted up to qualified firefighter and then senior firefighter, which is what I am. It takes six years and then you can pr progress through the ranks to become officers. I love the fact that when I'm at work, it doesn't feel like I'm at work. I feel like I'm hanging with my mates and I know those mates have my back 100% of the time. No matter what the situation it is that we're faced with, we work as a team and we get any job done. We look after one another. We're all like-minded people and we're in the same job for that very reason. Every day is different. You'll never know what to expect. I love that we can stay fit at work and train at work. And I actually love that I was able to learn how to cook at the fire station because all the boys were better chefs than I was. So that was definitely a tick. The fact that I can help the community and actually feel like I've achieved something is the most rewarding part. That my presence has helped somebody at the time they've needed the most. The look on someone's face when you see the look of relief on their eyes when you arrive to a job is gratitude enough. I've definitely been challenged with things and thrown in the deep, but that has helped mature me. It has helped shape me as a person and has definitely given me lifelong skills in work and in my own personal life. This job is a part of my life. I have met some people that will be with me forever and I wouldn't trade it for the world. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Alison. Our next firefighter to, to come up to the, the microphone is Mo Haddad, Senior Firefighter at Busby Fire Station. Uh, Mo's also a very experienced operator who's been in the South West for a lot of his career. And he has the, um, I suppose, fairly common uh, outcome that he also has a son who's a firefighter. So, um, yeah, I don't know when he had that kid. You're not old enough to have a son in the job, are you, Mo? So, yeah, good on you. Come up to the stage. Good afternoon all. As you're aware, my name is Mo Haddad. I'm a senior firefighter attached to Busby out at South West Sydney, just out near Liverpool. Most of you have preconceived ideas of what firefighters do on a daily basis, and you're all probably close to the mark. No day is ever the same as the last. The role of a firefighter includes things like attending different types of fires, such as house fires, bin fires, car fires, massive factory fires. We go to all different types of fires. We also do rescue. We cover a vast majority of the state in regards to rescue and rescue incidents. And some of these things that we attend are motor vehicle accidents, industrial accidents, large and small animal rescues, and cats up trees. And nowadays, you might have a laugh, we go to drones up trees. <laughs> Hazardous material incidents. So the environment is our future. Being a firefighter, we are responsible 
for ensuring the protection of all land-based and inland waterway spills throughout the state of New South Wales. We are fortunate enough to be able to engage with our communities also, and we have a large, vast, diverse community. Some of the things that we offer or tailor for are things like preschoolers, we go attend primary schools, we do high schools, we do things like rescue ed training for kids that are, or teenage kids that are about to get their licences. We also cater for our seniors. Uh, they're an integral part of our community, and we do home fire safety checks where we might go out and just check on their homes, make sure they're fire safe, make sure they've got working smoke alarms within their home, and just offer them key fire safety messages. You might have seen out there some things like a spatula, keep, keep your eyes, like keep looking when cooking, and things like that. So we offer all things like that. We are all a part of an amazing organisation. We continually save life and property, and I'm um, privileged enough to be in this job. My son's also in this job. I have the best job in the world, no doubt, and I look forward to seeing any of you guys on the back of the truck anytime soon. So take care, thank you. Thanks, Mo. Now I'd like to welcome up Alexandra Mulos, who uh, works at Liverpool Fire Station, which, as you would be aware, the southwest is quite a busy area. Alexandra also spent a stint in with us in our recruitment team. So welcome, Alex. Hi, everyone. Um, those are two very experienced firefighters to follow, but I'll give it my best shot. Um, my name is Alex Mullis. I'm a qualified firefighter at Liverpool Fire Station. I first started with Fire and Rescue in November of 2013 as a retained firefighter out of um, Threadbow in the Snowy Mountains. For me, I didn't join um, to be a. I, I didn't join because I always wanted to be a firefighter when I grew up, or because I knew someone in the job that. That, um, that said, hey, you should give it a go. But for me, I saw a group of incredibly hardworking um, people in my community providing a wonderful service to their community and I wanted to help. Um, prior to joining Fire and Rescue and while I was a retained firefighter, my primary occupation was working as a human resources manager for the resort. Um, so that role included managing administration, recruitment, payroll for over uh, a thousand staff. And I would be lying if I didn't say that sometimes the sound of the pager was a welcome relief um, from systems and spreadsheets. Um, so the pages we carried could go off at any time. It could be during dinner, it could be while we were skiing, or it could be you know, in the middle of an important meeting, we would drop everything in and get to the station. Um, as a firefighter, both retained and permanent, we do need to be prepared for anything. And in a rural retained station like Threadbow, it was particularly important because our closest backup was often 45 minutes away and the closest permanent station to where we were stationed was over two and a half hours away. So we were on our own a lot. Um, having learned so much from such a wonderful crew in the Snowy Mountains um, and enjoying the physical and me mental challenges that it posed being a retained firefighter, I realised that I didn't really want to sit behind a desk anymore and then I, that I wanted to apply for this job as my primary occupation. Um, I was accepted as a permanent firefighter and started at the State Training College in February of 2016, which I found very challenging and demanding. Um, I didn't come from a technical background or a mechanical background, and despite all of the training I already had, I found it very difficult. I, um, I, there was always so much to learn, and we're always introduced to new skills and, conce and concepts. And after 13 weeks of training, I was exhausted at the end of every single day. Um, but got through it and moved on to uh, station life. Since completing college, um, I was attached to Rose Meadow Station and Busby Station um, while still living in Threadbow. So I travelled a lot, a long, long way to get to work, which is the reality of most firefighters, particularly when they're starting the job. Um, Having previously worked in an organisation that was very organised and predictable, I found it really difficult on my first day that um, when I couldn't, I realised I couldn't plan out my day because I never knew what would be happening. Um, not knowing what job would be heading out to next was a difficult concept for me to grasp. And still now, three years later as a permanent firefighter, I still ask my crew on a daily basis, what jobs are we going to get today? Knowing full well that nobody actually can tell me the answer, but it's nice to ask. Um, 
In the last three years, I've worked at three very different stations, one a little bit quiet, one really busy with jobs, and now one uh, busy with jobs and technical training. So each of these stations have had their, um, their own advantage, advantages and challenges. Um, what's been really different for me from my retained station, where everyone in my crew I'd pretty much known my whole life, being in a, pers uh, in a permanent station, people are constantly coming and going um, with, with change of shift or station transfers. And I've come to understand it's really important to be flexible, friendly and adaptable with every one of these changes because they're very common. Um, coming from being constantly busy and, and, and not having a lot of downtime, I initially found the, the, the quiet times a bit difficult, but through experience and, and, and learning how much you do need to be prepared, um, I understand how important those quiet times can be to be prepared for the busy times and the tough times. And this can be anything from going to the gym to make sure you're physically ready, doing an extra drill with your crew, um, working on the next qualifications that you might be, be working towards within the job, station cleaning, trekking the truck that you use, that, that you do every day and conducting community en engagement activities with your crew. Um, I really enjoy being at a busy station and constantly upskilling and maintaining skills. Um, and I certainly have a lot more to learn to have anywhere near experience, the experience that any people on this panel have. Um, one of the most important lessons for me that I've learnt working in fire and rescue is that we're all part of a team that has a common goal. Um, having different and new people around you all the time gives you an opportunity to learn from the different experiences and take on different perspectives of other people. So currently on my shift, um, we roll two trucks with six team members and at any given job, those six different team members can look at the job from a different per perspective and that one task and can see six different solutions. Um, there might not necessarily be a wrong solution or a right solution, but every perspective that people bring to this job is, value in coming to the, is valuable in coming to the final resolution. Uh, in addition to the different perspective each member brings, um, and the, uh, one second. <laughs> each member of the crew brings different skill sets and can serve different functions. Um, it would be incorrect to say that in every circumstance, every firefighter has the same abilities because that's not correct, but to achieve our objectives, it requires input from every one of those team members. Um, for me, the thing I most enjoy about being a firefighter is the same reason that I joined in the first place. And that can be from the four-year-old that now knows to call 000 if they have a fire, or all the way up to the 93-year-old woman who's now in hospital getting care because my crew and I helped carry her down the stairs to the ambulance. No matter what I'm doing with my crew throughout the day, I know that the job I do in Fire and West in Fire and Rescue New South Wales in some way every day is helping people in our community. Thanks very much, Alex. As you can see, uh, a lot of our people are very passionate about the work they do and certainly comes through in, in your talk as well there. Thank you, Alex. Our next person up to the microphone is Station Officer William Billy Speck. Uh, Billy, once again, has, has been around a while, as he will say and he loves the job that he does. Interestingly, Bill has worked a fair bit in community engagement and also many years out in operations, uh, as he is now, is as an operational station officer. And one of his great uh, contributions to our organisation has been through his work with the iFairs program, which is the Indigenous Fire and Rescue Employment Strategy, which has been a really successful program of ours. So, you know, I thank Billy for his work there and, and welcome him up to the microphone. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, ladies. No, we won't go there. Um, yeah, very structured, and uh, you can see why um, Fire and Rescue in New South Wales are trying to get more females in the job, just for the compassion and the, and the reasoning that they show. Um, again, 1985 was when I joined. Um, it wasn't that difficult to get in then. I think they just dragged me off the street and said, here's a job for you, you want it? Um, I sort of fitted the bill, big, ugly and useless. So. So here I am now, 34 years later. Um, again, I started as a recruit fire and then went out to Western Sydney um, where they could burn water out there. So, so we really enjoyed that and uh, the busy times. But it's not all 
all emergency situations, it's 90% of your time is in that station, helping the community, doing different things. Um, we're always maintaining our skills, always doing drills, ensuring that when, when we are, when something is on, we're ready to go. Um, we're always doing things out in the community. We're doing uh, building exercises, just doing pre-incident planning, so we know what's in our area. We sort of have some sort of idea what to expect when we do go out there. Um, fire education, as uh, they touched on, um, from senior ed down to, to junior ed, pre-ed levels, um, rescue ed. We go out, we check hydrants. We just go out to prepare ourselves. We've got that time um, and we're preparing ourselves and we're up, up, updating our skills. Uh, career pathways, uh, once you get to a qualified firefighter, there are different career pathways you might want to take. If you fight, find that um, being on the back of the truck or fighting fires or going to emergencies, not quite what you expected. So you might just go into another community engagement role, which I tried for a little bit. Uh, fire, uh, fire investigation, K9 handlers, uh, ComSafe, which is community safety, recruit instructors so you can become a teacher within the organisation. There's plenty of um, avenues and career pathways if that's yours. Um, personally, most, most people stay as firefighters because it's just a great job. But you can go there for months at a time and see what these jobs entail, and it also helps you for promotion. Um, a question I get asked most is, um, how did you go when you seen your first dead person or, or carnage, a bit of carnage? And um, you can't answer that. You're not going to know. You're not going to... Not everything's raised in this job. It is a great job. But you're not going to know until you see something that you're not quite sure of how you feel. Now, there are um, policies and procedures and, and things in place like critical incident debrief teams and that, and Brett's going to go a little bit more into that later. But um, what, I'd like, what I'd like to say is that you've made the first step. You're all here now. Um, keep going. Do your uh, research into Fire and Rescue New South Wales, especially if you get to that interview stage. Find out um, what they require from you. So um, come and join the family. You will enjoy it. It is one of the best jobs in the world. Um, I've never had a real job. I joined at 19, so um, I've always loved going to work. So enjoy. Thank you. Thank you, Billy. Much appreciated. Our next speaker is another experienced officer, is uh, Brett Johnson, who works at Castle Hill Fire Station. Um, I'm, I'm, think, I'm not sure what Brett's going to speak about today, but I, I imagine he will touch on the Quakers Hill nursing, nursing home fire. Brett was the first station officer to arrive there at that incident, which is a, a significant fire that everyone would be aware of, and, and the flow-on effects of that is has been some positive change in, in legislation around... Um, smoke, smoke alarms and, and fire protection systems in, in those type of buildings. So welcome to the microphone, Brett. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, yes, uh, Brett Johnson. Um, I've been with the organisation since 1999 and I've been doing rescue for about 18 of those 20 years. So I've, um, I've had, had my fair share of exposure, uh, like Bill touched on, of all sorts of questions. If uh, yeah, later on you want to talk to me about I'm I'm happy to have a chat to anyone afterwards. We've certainly got some stories, as the whole panel would have. Uh, before I... Uh, I've got some questions that recruitment wanted me to answer, and so I'll just run through that as, as I flick through the pages. Uh, what, what did I do before becoming a firefighter? Well, actually, I, I did a multitude of jobs. I, I didn't know what I wanted to do. My father used to be a firefighter with this organisation as well, and I didn't follow his, his pathway. I, I wanted to go my own way. So I bounced from being a registered nurse, you know, did retail, I did industrial work, doing industrial sewing. I, I was a courier driver. I bounced to everything, and eventually it came back to, no, I think I'll give this a go. This is what I want to do, and I haven't looked back. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. Describe a difficult situation I've attended. There's been plenty, um, but so I'll, I'll run through a little spiel that, I, that I've written down for you all. So the following points are made to ensure that you, as applicants, have an insight into an event that you could face the first day out of the academy. Uh, Quakers Hill Nursing Home Fire occurred on November 18th, 2011, at 0453 hours. So that's a time that's stuck in my head for many years now. I was the uh, station officer on the first arriving appliance um, at Schofield. Uh, fire station and I had three very experienced firefighters that were in the job longer than I was uh, when I attended that fire. 
Uh, what was thought to be an automatic fire alarm with no triple zero call turned out to be one of the most horrifically intentionally lit fires in Australia. The scene started to unfold with unstoppable pace, bringing along with it multiple casualties with catastrophic burns and horrific injuries of the likes which I never thought people could sustain. Many lost their lives that day right in front of the, all of the firefighters that attended in tragic circumstances. Uh, a significant response was required and called upon and the experience of the attending firefighters ranged from first year out to decades in. The exposure and pressure of being part of these sorts of incidents is something you can face from day one out of the academy. And just like on this day, there are incidents and injuries that you would never have thought uh, of, of been exposed to in, in your regular day uh, or your life, you'll inevitably come across in this line of work. So when you, when you decide to be a firefighter, you're going, to, you're going to see things that you would never have seen before. There will be times you wish you could do more, but you'll have limited success. And it's due to a number of variables, and this can often sit heavy amongst a firefighter's psyche. Of the initial crews involved with the Quakers job, um, we all met back at a station straight after the incident. There was a, a group of people called our peer support team who were, were on the scene ready to talk to us. So they're part of a, a program, we have an employees assistance program as well, but these people were actually uh, triggered off to come and see us straight after the incident. So we literally went from the fire ground back to the station and they're all there waiting to talk to us. Uh, there's now mechanisms, many mechanisms in place to assist firefighters in dealing with stress and trauma uh, that will prepare firefighters to get back on track if necessary. Uh, through critical incident debriefing and hot debriefings and all sorts of things that we do to make sure that we capture uh, is everyone, how is everyone feeling after being exposed to incidents such as that. We've also got a great chaplaincy support and a really good network of um, a, a great chaplain, chaplaincy support with him and his wife. So that, that's a little bit further down the track for you if you get in. Okay, so why have I been asked to share this with you? Now firstly, so that you understand that while you're an operational firefighter with fire and rescue, the chances that at some point in time you'll be confronted with significant events are, are definite. These events are usually not experienced by the general public throughout the course of their lifetime, but to you it will be your everyday job. There are times where you'll be tired, uh, you'll be emotional, you'll be cold, you'll be frustrated, you'll also be elated and excited, uh, immensely satisfied and above all challenged. But that's just simply part of our job. It's not all driving around in shining red trucks and uh, visiting schools all the time. And uh, quite often when people apply for this, they are uh, applying for the wrong reasons. They think that'll be a really fun job. And it is fun and it's a great team and it's a, it's a big family network, but there's, there's going to be that other side of it as well. So my final note is whenever a candidate or an applicant over these many years that I've been involved in helping recruitment have come up to the station or rung me on a phone and asked, about the process, I want to know how to get in, I want to know, just tell me, tell me how I get in. It's quite often with a, a little bit of an angle where, tell me the shortest way to get into this job, and it really shouldn't be done like that. There's two questions I always ask these people. Number one, tell me why you want to become a firefighter. And then, and really give me that, that answer, because if it's about the shiny truck driving down the street and uh, tooting the horn and telling your friends you've got a pretty cool uniform, it probably won't cut it for too long. The second one I ask them is, tell me what you think Fire and Rescue does. You'd be surprised how many people don't actually know what the job entails. If you think we just put out car fires and go to house fires, then we're missing a whole lot that we actually do, and you need to do a little bit more research on that. So having a good idea of both of these questions are a great way of starting uh, to find out if this career is for you. Um, it's, uh, so we're going to be available a little bit later on. If you've got any questions about what I've mentioned today or, or the recruitment team's here to tell you about recruitment, and I'm sure all the firefighters will be happy to talk to you about what the job's like. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Brett. Uh, one thing I'll say about our group here and also our firefighters that are out in the crowd, that you'll find that they, um, they're, they're respectful of each other they're respected by the people that work with them and for them, and they're respected by the people that they report to. Uh, they're also well respected by the community. So, um, you know, as you know, through our values, it's something that, that holds pretty strong. So, um, you know, 
I'd like to think that everybody in this room also has those traits of respect as well. So I thank everyone for, for being here today to, to have your chat about your experience as a firefighter and, and yeah, it's great to see you here. I'm just going to touch on a couple of things now around um, rostering and work arrangements of firefighters. So we have a legislated uh, roster cycle, uh, main roster cycle, which is the 1014 roster. That's two 10 hour day shifts and two 14 hour night shifts followed by four days off. Uh, when I was in fire stations, that's what the majority did, and I'm sure um, yeah, certainly Mo and, and Billy and Brett would have experienced that. We have an alternative roster now that's been um, taken up you know, on mass by firefighters, which is the 24 hour roster. So it's 24 hours at work, 24 off, 24 on and five days off. Um, the, the five days off, I suppose, is a bit of a misnomer in the sense that uh, it was... Alison, did you finish this morning or...? I'm an annual leader. You're an annual? Alex finished this morning. And, um, and even if, uh, I suppose, you know, the question you get from people in the community is, how many times did you respond last night? And the natural thought is that oh, if you only turned out once, you must be feeling pretty fresh. But, but the shift work has a different impact on your day to day and uh, and certainly when you're doing those rosters uh, you notice it more so it's not as, as brilliant as it sounds I mean it's nice to have those days off but it still takes its toll on you in a different way uh, and a lot of that work is on weekends as well so there needs to be you know preparation and understanding that you'll be working on weekends. You're required to work 336 hours over an eight week cycle and you're allocated to a platoon either A, B, C or D platoon. Uh, there's also some other rosters. There's some flexibility in rosters where if you need uh, for carer's responsibility, some sort of different version of that, um, that goes, your application would go to the commanders within that area and they can consider your needs and see if that'll fit in with the needs of, the, of that particular area. And we also have the special roster, which is Monday to Friday in certain fire stations throughout the state. Yeah, each platoon has set annual leave periods so that there's not too many people off at any one time. Uh, and that's, that's short and longer annual leave periods. So four weeks at one stage and then six or eight months later, you have a, a three week break as well. So um, you, you're getting the rest that you need and, and certainly it helps your sleep cycles and things like that to get in a normal pattern again. So that's, uh, and also firefighters are entitled to uh, 14 by 24 hour shifts of annual leave over 64 weeks. There is some opportunities for temporary changes and swaps of annual leave as well, um, if you can arrange it with, with somebody else if you want to have a particular time off. But generally, your annual leave's rostered, so you have to go off when, you, when you're required to. Um, Sue has told me numerous times that I need to plug the website. There you go. www.fire.nsw.gov.au. I'm sure most of you have visited that website previously to, to get information and, and to be here today as well. Now, um, the recruitment process overview. I'm going to hand over to you, Sue. Our manager of recruitment, Sue McDougall, will come and run you through the recruitment process. Oh, welcome, everyone. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Uh, so we'll just go through the slides. Um, oh, did I jump one? No. Okay. So this is our website, as Brendan mentioned, and this is the site that you'll be going to when our campaign opens on the 19th of July. So keep that date in your mind. It's open for two weeks. And uh, so if you go to the website, then you click on recruitment, then permanent firefighters, and there will be a link say apply, apply now. Okay, so uh, it's fairly easy. We don't go through the, it, when you click on the slide, site, it will then take you to the I Work for New South Wales website. So for those people that don't have a profile on that site, you'll just create one and then it will automatically upload your application uh, by filling in a few details. So the application process is actually quite simple. Uh, you don't need to submit a resume at that time. If you get to the interview stage, we will ask for an interview, uh, ask for a resume at that time. So you're just filling in your personal details. Your email account is very important because that's how you're identified as a candidate through your email account. So please use a reliable email account 
uh, and that you know that you regularly check because this is how we will communicate you through the throughout the process. All right. Um, so then we have the. I'll go into more detail about the psychometric testing. So once you apply, then there's some psychometric tests, and then of course the the big step is the physical aptitude test, and we have Mark Gabriel here, who's the manager of our health and fitness team and he will talk about more detail about that part of the process. And then we have our merit stages of the recruitment process where when you apply you will have to answer two targeted questions, 200 words each. Uh, they will be different questions if you've applied last year. Uh, but they will be looking at things as Brendan mentioned about our values. Uh, and have a look at our interview guide that's also on the website for assistance. And uh, after the assessment of the targeted questions, if you get through that stage, then we'll have, you'll have to verify your uh, online cognitive ability tests in a supervised setting. Then we have our interview and our medical process. And we also have Chrissy here, who's our manager of our medical team, who talk about that in more detail. So as I said, you go through the website and you apply. Now this year we've changed it. So this year, you might remember, for those people who applied last year, you had to wait till after the applications closed and then people, everyone was sent on the same day the link for the online tests. And people were only allowed to do two tests at that one time. So this year we're changing it so this year when you apply, if you apply on the first day, Monday the 19th of July, you will be sent the link automatically to complete the online tests. And you will be allowed to do the whole four tests. So not just two, but four tests. And I'll talk, you can see on the screen, it's cognitive ability, work, reli work safety, work reliability, and a new game-based test for emotional intelligence, so it's not the mesquite test that we used last year. Um, so if you applied last year and you've done a couple of those tests, you'll just release your results because you won't be able to sit the test again because it's within the 12 month policy. Okay, so I just wanted to bring that to everybody's attention and when, when you get that invite, you'll have 96 hours to complete the four tests. So Revellion is our testing provider. You can have a look on their website. There are some examples of the cognitive ability, uh, work reliability and work safety tests. There's no examples of Emotify on, the, on that uh, website. So the cognitive ability, um, it's tests obviously verbal, numerical and abstract reasoning. There's 51 questions, it's timed. It's 20 minutes, so uh, when you log in, if you, when you get the, um, the link, you go onto the Revelion website, log in, uh, it'll get you to make sure you read the terms and conditions of the testing, because you do need to be in a good frame of mind for testing. Uh, so if you're not feeling well, don't do the test at that time, all right? Make sure you're in a quiet space. Um, and you've got the right system requirements for the test. So you can't do it on your phone. You do need a, a laptop uh, or a PC and uh, you do need a mouse. You can't do it without a mouse, all right? You will disadvantage yourself if you're not set up with a mouse. Okay, it's aimed so that you don't finish. All right, so don't think, oh wow, 51 questions in 20 minutes, wow. Most people don't finish. All right, um, and it's about getting number of questions correct. So if you do 20 questions and you get 15 right, you get 15 points, all right? So you could try and complete as many questions as you can. You're just gonna get points for what you are successful. And there, as I said, there are an example questions on the Revelion website. Okay, the next test we've got is the work safety. Uh, it's not timed, it takes about 15 minutes. 
And uh, as you can see there, it tests your attitudes around uh, work safety. So there'll be a statement, and then you'll have four options in terms of responding, like um, totally agree, agree, disagree, totally disagree. So that'll be the range of responses. So you just click on whatever response it is. Um, all right, and a similar, in the work reliability is in the same type of response scale. So you'll get a statement. This is obviously testing um, your honesty, integrity, how you behave in the workplace. Once again, it's not time, it takes about 15 minutes though. So the Emotify is the new test. So we haven't used this test before as part of the campaign. Uh, this looks at emotional intelligence. Um, it is different to the Mesquite. So for the people that have had the, uh, completed the Mesquite last year, um, this is more around where you've got some facial expressions. It'll be timed and you have to pick what the facial expression is telling you. So are they happy, you know, sad, angry? Uh, so you pick and you've, it'll be quick. So the face will come up and, you know, happy at whatever, you've got to click and you get about three seconds for the answer. All right, so it's quite a interactive type uh, test and it takes about 20 minutes. So for this year, as I said, all four tests will be uh, aggregated. Each candidate will then receive a suitability score and then that will determine who progresses to the next stage, which is the PAT. So uh, it is fairly competitive to get through this part of the process. We normally have between six and 8,000 apply for about 120 jobs. Okay. Thanks very much, Sue. I'm going to have Mark Gabriel come up, our team leader for health and fitness. But I just also want to take this opportunity to talk about uh, the man you may have run into out the back who has a backpack and is handing out brochures about psychometric testing. I need to state that they aren't affiliated with Fire and Rescue New South Wales and we believe that some of the claims they're making on their pamphlets are, are untrue and incorrect. So um, we certainly want to disassociate ourselves with anything. Uh, we also had same company here last year in our, in our sessions offering out those pamphlets, but I, I certainly caution you to be wary about the, the promises that they make on their documentation. So thanks, Mark. Thanks, Brendan. Uh, hello to you all. Can you, can you hear me up the back? Great, great. So I have the privilege to talk to you about the PAT. Um, and I, I suppose to keep the objectives quite simple, it's all the information about what it entails, what you need to do to be successful in the PAT, but also touch upon uh, where you're going to be at physically in terms of making sure you absolutely nail your physical preparation, or if you're already there, that you make sure you actually bring that on the day of the PAT should you be invited to do that. Now, in doing that, I, I, I suppose my goal is to give you a lot of hard and fast, you know, black and white tangible information, I'm gonna, but I'm going to try to find the sweet spot between that information and I suppose a bit of richness of context that might tie in with some of the key messages and information that's already come from some of the firefighters. So said another way, I get, I get to bring together some of the important messages from our panel of firefighters uh, to really convey to you guys um, what the health and fitness of a firefighter really means. Because if you don't understand why you're physically preparing for the PAT, I'd humbly suggest you're missing half of the, uh, half of the stuff that you're looking for. So, yeah, we take health, fitness, and indeed your safety very seriously. Uh, to illustrate this, just, just to set the scene, allow me to throw uh, the following at you. And, uh, now, these comments, you'll find some of these uh, uh, come from how folks whose job is in the strength of con and conditioning of tactical athletes. Think about uh, various sections like my section that work with fire, police, military. We get together at conferences, have big powwows, and we throw around a bunch of jargon. Other comments are, qu are quotes from countless firefighters that, that my team would consider as tactical athletes as well, uh, that we work with. And if you look past what seem, might, might seem like a bunch of cliches, there's actually some serious messages which I, I strongly encourage you to take to heart. 
Uh, game day is every day. The opposition doesn't play by the same rules. Uh, loss is not counted in points. The aim is to come home safe. And uh, I typed it up probably two hours ago, but the message has come out from a couple of the guys here on the panel. No two shifts are the same. The conditions at the job or multiple jobs within the same shift, they're never ideal, but that's what, that's what we're trained to do, okay? They train to get it right. And a couple of things that we hear out at Station Land, because my team's core job is to look after the incumbents, the guys that are on the job, is, uh, and I'll put it as a quote, I'm not quoting anyone in particular, I'd expect a new recruit's fit fitness is robust enough to pass the pat on a bad day. I'll tell you a bit more about what I mean by that as we go. Now, the pat, it, it's a non-negotiable safety aspect of the recruitment process. It, it took three years as a body of work with the Uni Wollongong to determine a specific and valid uh, testing battery that's specific to our organisation's response profile. As the name suggests, and as the Chief Superintendent spoke to, our capabilities are really broad. Last I checked the stats, we probably spend uh, a single digit percentage, so less than 10% of our time are we putting the wet stuff on the hot stuff. All those other capabilities tie into the testing battery that you know as the, the modern day PAT. Um, and the PAT's there to determine who is physiologically capable or physiologically safe to do the job. So how does it tie in with all the messages and the organisation's values of respect, integrity, service and courage? Um, as I alluded to before, my team spend most of their times out at stations assisting firefighters to stay fire fit. Now, we know a candidate ha now, if we know that a candidate has a respect for themselves and who they're going to end up working alongside, that they take their fitness seriously enough so that they're fit enough to, on a bad day, pass the pat. This means lifting that ladder rescuing a mate, I heard the word mate or team thrown around a lot from the panel, uh, on a bad day. So if this is you, I can confidently go out to station and tell these guys that the recruits coming through are fit enough to keep themselves safe, to keep their crew safe, and ultimately the public safe. Uh, previous information night, we had, uh, we, we had a previous video that we put up there and we basically, when we were rolling out the PAT since 2013, we actually put our operational inspector through this task force. And we've got a picture of uh, us rolling camera on this inspector straight after. He's absolutely blowing afterwards and his comments were, I'm confident that anybody that comes through this pat, I can tell all of the operational commanders that the guys are physically prepared to do the job. So I better start talking about the pat videos. Now, to reduce the time that you need to put up with me and my voice, I encourage you to pay close attention to these videos. Uh, even rewatch them on the Fire and Rescue website that uh, Brendan was speaking to. Heck, they're even on YouTube, so I'm sure you can find them there, okay? These videos actually give you a very clear, a very clear and outlining all of the safety and competency criteria for each task in the PAT. If you execute the PAT according to these videos, you'll do well. Uh, to execute the PAT according to these videos, you need to be fire fit. We'll talk about that after the videos. The only things I'm going to talk about after, after we run through these videos are useful pieces of information that, that were missing from the videos. So get your pen ready. Uh, or just wait until this presentation is on the web later on that website. But we'll get through these videos first. Stage 1. Reduced visibility search. Firefighting requires firefighters to work in situations where there is limited or no visibility in confined spaces. This task simulates your ability to work in a smoke-filled building wearing a self-contained breathing apparatus performing a victim search in a dark and confined space. To complete the task, you'll be required to fit a frosted face mask with the assistance of your assessor. The face mask allows normal breathing to occur and will not be connected to an air cylinder. You'll be required to perform a crawling search in a dark and potentially confined space as directed by your assessor. You must be able to wear the mask for the whole search and move forward in a safe and consistent way. Ladder Simulation Firefighting relies on using ladders. This task simulates raising and lowering a 10.5 metre ladder for firefighting and rescue work. To complete the task, position feet shoulder width apart, squat down and with an overhand grip, grasp the bar. Using your legs to lift, raise the bar to navel height, squat again and move your arms under the bar. Using your legs to initiate the movement, push the bar overhead in one continuous movement until your arms are completely straight.
you should be able to push the bar into an overhead position with straight arms in one continuous movement. Stage 2 is made up of four tasks. Firefighters generally complete this stage in under 15 minutes. Single-sided jerry can carry. This task simulates a hazardous materials incident where firefighters repeatedly carry drums, equipment or casualties as a team. To complete the task, grip the jerry can in one hand, lift it using a half squat and carry it a distance of 195 metres which is six and a half laps of the marked 30 metre course. You must complete the full distance while maintaining your balance and perform all lifting and carrying using only one hand at a time. You may swap hands at any time as often as you wish. To swap hands, place the jerry can on the ground, grip with your other hand and use the squat to lift it before starting again. Do not use two hands at any time. You must not drop the jerry can, drag it, use any part of your body to support the jerry can or use two hands to complete the carry. Stair climb with single sided jerry can carry. Firefighters constantly have to climb stairs with heavy equipment to perform their work. This task simulates climbing stairs with firefighting equipment. To complete the task, grip the jerry can in one hand. Lift it using a squat and step up and down for 36 steps. You may swap sides as many times as you like. To swap sides, place the jerry can on the ground, grip with the other hand and use a squat to lift it before starting again. At no time should both hands be used to lift or carry the jerry can. You must not drop the jerry can, attempt to use any part of your body to support the jerry can, or use a two-handed hold at any time. Rescue tool static holds. Firefighters are required to use a variety of equipment to perform their role. This task simulates the use of a rescue tool in a motor vehicle accident rescue. To complete the task, you will hold a set of simulation spreaders at three different heights for 40 seconds continuously, with a 20-second break between each height. Shoulder level hold. Grip the rescue tool as shown. Lift it using a squat or lunge. Ensure you have a firm grip and stable stance, then raise it to hold at shoulder height and parallel to the ground. Ensure the tool does not rest on any part of your body and hold it static for 40 seconds. Return the rescue tool safely to the ground using a squat or lunge to lower it. There is a 20 second rest before the next lift. Waist level hold. Grip the rescue tool as per the first hold and lift it using a squat or lunge. Ensure the tool does not rest on any part of your body and that your arms are bent and not locked straight. Hold it parallel to the ground at waist level for 40 seconds and then return it safely to the ground using a squat or lunge to lower it. There is a 20 second rest before the next lift. Knee level hold. Grip the rescue tool as per the previous holds and lift them to knee height. Ensure the tool does not rest on any part of your body. Position the shears parallel to the ground and hold for 40 seconds. Return it safely to the ground using a squat or lunge to lower it. During this task, you must not drop the shears or rest them on any part of your body. You should hold the shears parallel to the ground. Repeated hose drag. This task simulates the prolonged dragging of pressurized hose during a bushfire. To complete the task, grip the handle attached to the hose and place the hose over your shoulder. Drag the hose forward, ensuring that your torso is upright and facing forward for the full 30 meter marked course. At the marker, hand the hose to the assessor and walk back to the starting point. This is repeated five times. You may swap shoulders with the hose as many times as you wish. If you fall, turn your body side on or face backwards when dragging, you will be stopped and asked to begin that lap again. Your time will not be reset, but will be paused while the hose is repositioned. Remember, 
Should you finish early, you'll not be able to commence stage 3 before 15 minutes. Should you take longer than 15 minutes, you'll be able to progress directly into stage 3. Stage 3 Stage 3 is made up of two tasks. Firefighters generally completed this stage in under two minutes. Fire attack simulation. Sometimes when fighting a fire, there is a thick layer of smoke in a dwelling. This task replicates dragging a hose while keeping below the neutral plane, the smoke layer, in a structural fire. To complete the task, grip the handle attached to the hose and lower your entire body into a crawling position below the 1.25 meter height marker. Advance forward for a distance of 30 meters, which is one lap of the marked course. If you exceed the height, turn your body side on or face backwards when dragging, you will be stopped and asked to begin again. Your time will not be reset, but will be paused while the hose is returned to the start. Firefighter Rescue This task simulates rescuing a firefighter from a structural fire. To complete the task, squat or lunge down, Grip the harness straps and move the back plate into a vertical position. Using your legs to lift, stand up while safely lifting the back plate off the ground. Lower yourself below the height marker of 1.55 meters and move backwards for 10 meters, keeping the back plate off the ground. You may stop to adjust your grip, however you must stay under 1.55 meters and ensure that the back plate is off the ground before you continue. If you exceed the height, fall, drop the back plate or drag the back plate along the ground, you'll be stopped and asked to begin again. Your time will not be reset, but will be paused while the back plate is returned to the start. So I suppose it's uh, relevant, but one quick self-indulgent comment is, uh, yeah, when you're over six foot, that, that last uh, task is never fun. If you're five foot, you got it nailed. So I've only got three bullet points that I want to get to that were either not clear or not included in that video. Uh, and this is where pet pens are going to come in handy. So stage two, you must complete all of those tasks competently in under 15 minutes to be competent and to pass the pack. Stage three, you must complete those last two tasks, including that annoying 1.55 neutral plane for uh, in under two minutes to be competent. Uh, the next point I've got for you is the word simulation is incorrect. Get that, get that word out of your head, okay? Because uh, indeed, we've had about 3,000 people come through uh, permanent applications to the PAT stage, and they're challenging and asking all these questions around the task course and how it is. The, t the PAT test is what it is. It is bona fide and, and reflective of the job. But let me give you a bit more context to that. The PAT's designed to see that you have the right mix of fitness characteristics, strength, endurance, your ability to handle metabolic heat. It's not, it's not the technical skills. You gain these technical skills as you progress through the academy and in particular as when you're out in station land on the job honing your craft. Now, technically or theoretically, um, if you actually got two candidates that have the exact same physical characteristics, all the sort of gamers and that in the world are probably, in the room are probably leaning forward now, uh, but one has, uh, one has more experience in actually handling a hose or dealing with a rescue tool, technically they should perform similarly in the PAT because the operationally specific skill has been stripped from the test. Last bullet point is the numbers. Everyone's looking at those jerry cans and the ladders and going, what are all that, what, you know, what am I actually carrying? So here it is. Uh, now the ladder, now these guys will correct me if I'm wrong, a standard ladder on a standard appliance is it extends to 10.2? It's 42 kilos though, isn't it? Yep. Now, for those that saw the visual information on the video, it's a mechanically braked apparatus, which means you can't accelerate that bar like anything you would in the gym, even one of those cable pin-loaded pulley-based systems. Uh, you, need to, you need to be able to lift this item with almost zero acceleration. Uh, so those that are into uh, force velocity curves and those types of things, you're at your strongest when you move slower. So it's not an Olympic lift where, uh, in that the resistance break is the same at every position of the lift. Uh, you're gonna, and you're going to need to know the weak spots in your lift. The amount of force you need to exert depends on how fast and balanced you are with your movement. Notice I didn't tell you how much weight you need to lift in the gym. Because what we've done with our high-tech fancy calibration equipment, we've seen people move that bar with as little as 28 to 30 kilos of force. But the thing is they're doing it slow, 
steady and strong. And we've seen people absolutely try to completely jerk and accelerate the movement. And they've had to put through this force gauge 40 or 50 kilos to overcome that mechanical brake mechanism. It's jerky, they're trying to move it fast, they're unbalanced and they're ineffective. All of the energy is being leaked out into that brake system. That's about as detailed information I can give you about the lift for this, uh, for this presentation. Now the hazmat jerry can, the one where you walk in 195 metres, it's 26 kilos. You're going to hear all this quartz stone wriggling around in the bottom there because it's a 22 litre jerry can. The staircase jerry can is 17 and a half kilos. The hose advance, it basically simulates the average drag of a charged 38 millimetre hose. So what the numbers actually stack up to is you've got 11 kilos of hose, uh, branch and whatnot. It's in that three metre length. And then it's attached to 27 kilos of horizontal force. So make sure when you go into the gym, you don't just set up a sled with 27 kilos on it. I said horizontal force. So that's some information that you guys can work with uh, when you're working through your training programs. And then the rescue task, it's no more complicated than getting a guy that's probably about my size with full kit on. I'm a bit heavier than what I look. And completely knocked out and trying to rescue them. So it's a 70 or 80 kilo firefighter with 20 kilos of stuff on them. The physics of it is it breaks up to, you've got to overcome 30 kilos of force off the ground, but then overcome that break, giving you 56 kilos of horizontal resistance. And I, I was aware that those slides were there, but they almost reiterate in different words, they're not my words, some of the messages that we said from the top there. But we'll get on to talking about the training guide and whatnot. So talking about your training and your general preparation, um, so to more effectively talk about the training guide, I'm going to clarify one thing. It's what I mean by on a bad day. Uh, when I say a bad day, I'm, I'm mostly talking about physical aspects. I acknowledge that for some of us, a bad day could be personal or psychologically related. And we certainly don't want you to be a robot. On the contrary, uh, I'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, what I mean is if your current or your, your maximal effort gets it done most of the time, it's probably not good enough. You might not pass the pat on the day that you show up. Uh, and you need to improve the relevant components of your fitness that you're falling short on. You need to strengthen the weakest link in your chain. So all of these uh, links, as they were, they're, they're, uh, they're highlighted in this training guide uh, with a particular focus on developing um, your strength through resistance training and your cardiovascular system specific to the job. Um, now, the principles that you're going to see as you go through this training guide, it's on the website. Uh, to strengthen and condition your body to deal with uh, that metabolic heat, that 20 kilos of stuff that you've got on your person, the firefighting tunic, doesn't let any of the heat out. It's really good at stopping about 1,000 degrees, getting to your body in a hurry, but the problem is your metabolic heat doesn't get out. Um, it's also there to help you manage carrying load continuously, just trudging through the job. So the, uh, the PAT test is designed so you're basically putting force into the ground for 17 minutes, just constantly moving gear around. And also you need to be used to just being puffed non-stop. The firefighter that you saw on those videos, uh, senior firefighter, Tara Lell, or maybe she's a leading firefighter now. Um, she's an absolute weapon, but even her, her words in the previous videos we had was that uh, the beep test, if anybody's familiar with that, it's a gradual thing. But for this, somewhere within about the first two or three minutes of stage two, she could feel that her heart rate was at the same as the old 9.6 standard of the beep test that we had in the old pad. So a couple more things that you want to note in regards to this guide. It outlines where you need to be at and how you need to get there. Example, raw strength. Your worst day needs to be well over a 40 kilo strict, strict press. So when I was giving you all that detailed information about the brake mechanism and sticking points in your lift, you need to almost be able to get 40, I don't know, let's add a bit more, 45, and if I said hold it there, great. If I said go up an inch, go up an inch. If I say go down slowly an inch, you should be able to control that weight. No acceleration or anything like that. Um, a couple of other things to think about in terms of your preparation. If you can't do it now, it doesn't mean you can't do it yet. You can work through the right periodized program to get those physical attributes that you require. Big does not equal strong. I'm totally humbled in my, in my trade. Uh, work with colleagues of the, the PhD variety and whatnot. Probably 20 kilos lighter than me and can lift 10, 20% more off the ground than what I can. It's amazing. They've just got that much training age under their belt. The other thing you want to note is that going through this guide does not guarantee that you'll pass the pat. I just had to give you that piece of information as well. 
Uh, this guide also embodies the same training principles behind what my team provides to these guys every day in the job. The whole fire fit wording that we put behind it is prepare, fuel, train recovery and recover. Game day is every day, but here's a couple of comments to help you understand the fire fit philosophy better. Um, and it's all got to do with this idea of on a bad day and not being a robot and absolutely smashing yourself in the gym. Indeed, we get a lot of candidates come back, uh, dare I say, year after year, really frustrated because they thought the solution from one campaign to the next was to do that extra repetition. When in fact for them, what they needed to do was drop the repetitions, up the weight and have a two, two extra days rest and a really good night's sleep, sleep, lots of fueling and whatnot. But just to quickly work through the words, quality training is about being the opposite of a robot. It's monitoring or listening to your body and not just executing a workout because the cookie cut program said that you have to uh, do that session today. Sure, when you're at the job, you can't control what's going on there, but in your training, particularly with five fit principles, you need to get your preparation and your recovery right. That's really important. Uh, is your training or other life priorities just constantly breaking you down? Where does the adequate fueling or rest, just a good old fashioned good night's sleep come into play to help you recover and adapt to what you're throwing at yourself with your training program? Stress is stress, it doesn't matter where it comes from, whether it's from your workout or from life. And I think in this day and age of you know, strength and conditioning and, and the way that we're trying to prepare everybody for the job or even preparing to get on the job, you need to look at yourself as a whole person, guys. Now, to bring uh, the above principles and more specifically the messages of the training guide to life, uh, just another comment for you. Uh, live and exclusive here, uh, we've got a number of short and sharp training videos that are being produced currently and they're going to be on the website in the coming month. So we want you to keep your finger on the pulse. Uh, these topics will include developing maximal strength in that overhead lift or in the deadlift and, and squatting type movements, developing your cardiovascular fitness specific to firefighting. There's actually a couple of fireys in the room who are going to star on these videos, so uh, keep your eye out for them. Um, developing strength endurance, the ability to just keep trudging up and down the stairs, around and about on the incident ground. Keep an eye on the website, those videos will be on there, and also I suppose another quick plug for uh, the Fire Fit by Fire and Rescue New South Wales Facebook page. Uh, all I say about this page for now is that we continually provide stories and information around that Fire Fit message, prepare, fuel, train and recover, and I'm pretty sure that these videos will be on there as well. So at the pat. I'm not going to play karaoke with that, or will I? Yes, I will. Okay. You need to provide your cu a current medical certificate. Certificate. The forms have been cleaned up, so it says very clearly that you are cleared for a six-month period from the date of signing by your medical practitioner. You need to wear appropriate exercise clothing, uh, no singlets and sports shoes. Uh, a quick comment that we've learnt now that we've moved to doing these tests on an indoor facility, the, the leggings, the, the spandex that goes past the knee, it slides around like crazy on the uh, turnout gear. So you're better off having something that just cuts to there or just wear shorts because you will get no purchase at the ground when you're trying to do that second last task in the pat. There's another value add for you there. Come well hydrated to bring water. You must do a pat induction and you can't do it on the same day. So the pat hasn't changed. All of the specs that I told you, they haven't changed since 2013. As I alluded to before, about 3,000 people have progressed and been tested against this same standard. The, the standard doesn't discriminate. Countless applicants have failed. Uh, it's not about us. We just want to give these guys uh, a promise that we've got good candidates coming through. About 9,000 people apply. We get several hundred come out to the PAT. Please don't show up there because you're on a bet, because my team are out there for countless days just getting quality results through to recruitment. Um, and we want you to do your best, even if it's a bad day. If you pass the PAT, you, can be, you may be considered for interview. There's no ranking of the PAT times, because if you're seven foot a zillion, or four foot nothing, you're going to walk through the PAT task course at different paces. It's designed that way. You can't run at any time in the PAT, but you need to do it in the time frames that I described before. So all the best to you. Uh, to you. Good luck with your preparation. We look forward to seeing you out there. Thank you, Mark. So we'll just continue now with the, uh, after the PAT, the merit uh, steps of the recruitment process. Uh, so I'll just look at this slide. Okay, so the first step in the process is the assessment of the targeted questions. So for the people who pass the PAT, um, your uh, targeted questions that you've 
uh, completed as part of your online application will be assessed by five different panels. So each panel will have two members on the panel. Uh, there will be a recruiter on every panel as well as an operational firefighter. Um, yeah, so that will determine whether you then progress to the next stage, which is the online verification process. Um, so just looking at the assessment of the targeted questions there. So as I said, uh, in the application, it will tell you that each question, you'll have a 200 word limit and we will um, make sure you keep to that limit. Just bear in mind, you know, if we're looking at, you know, 500 applications times two responses, so that's a lot of documentation uh, that each panel will be looking at. So each panel will probably look at about 60 or 70 responses of two questions each and those scores are aggregated and uh, that will determine who then progresses to the next stage, which is the online verification process. And this is where you'll come into our headquarters at Greenacre um, in southwestern Sydney and complete a supervised test for the cognitive ability. So it won't necessarily be the exact same questions now, there are a bank of questions that the testing provider use, uh, so, but it will be, have the same level of difficulty. And obviously the aim is to just to make sure that the person who completed the first test at home is the same person completing the supervised test. So you must verify in terms of that test to then progress to the next stage, which is the interview. And for this year, we're changing it. Uh, so there will be an interview with four panels instead of five. Uh, but we're having then another exercise where it'll be a group exercise. So uh, we'll have four candidates go through, say for the 30 minutes, each person will be asked, uh, go through a panel of four. So each panel will ask you one question you'll get five minutes to answer that question, then you move on to another panel. After those four panels, those four candidates will then move into another room and there will be a group exercise or role play. And then we'll have different assessors assessing those candidates. Then what we'll do at the end of the whole process is you'll have some scores from the group exercise, scores from the interview, and they'll be collated uh, by the recruitment team. So both panels won't see the scores and then that will determine who progresses to the next stage. Uh, we do have on our website, and it's interesting, uh, we did some, got some feedback from candidates who were successful uh, maybe 12 months ago in terms of, you know, what did they use to prepare for the interview? And all of them put up their hand that they used our interview guide. So I would strongly recommend that. It does talk about using the STAR method when you're answering questions. Uh, so, and this is how we assess our questions. So as I said, people are ranked and then that will determine whether you then progress to the next stage, which is the medical assessment. Up to Chrissy, thank you. Thank you. Hi guys, as you can see, my name is Chrissy Strickland and I'm the team leader for Health and Medical for Fire and Rescue. This is all about your medical assessment that's the next stage, as Sue's just said as well. So if you progress to the medical component or the application stage, there's some really important things you need to know. The conditions of firefighting are unique and the cardiovascular, physical and psychological demands of the job are high. Fire and Rescue has a duty of care to individual firefighters, their colleagues and the public and subsequently firefighter applicants are medically assessed to ensure they, it's my little clicker. You can, thanks lovely, click for me lovely. <laughs> ensure they can carry out essential tasks without significantly increasing their personal risk of injury or illness and are unlikely to, pay, to place others at risk. And you meet the medical standards for commercial vehicle drivers. There is no exhaustive list of medical conditions which prevents you 
from applying for a permanent position as a firefighter for fire and rescue. We assess people on a case-by-case -case basis. In general, we are concerned about conditions carrying a risk of sudden incapacity or impairment, conditions that, that could affect your functional capacity to, for, to perform firefighting tasks, and conditions which could be aggravated by firefighting duties. There are some medical conditions which are potentially significant for safe firefighting. If you receive your invitation for a medical, you may be required to supply further information for the medical assessment. These might be cardiovascular, orthopaedic, renal, neurological, respiratory, endocrine and significant mental health issues. So you bring documentation like your hospital discharge summaries, GP reports, previous special reports, updated specialist reports, operation reports and MRI or X-ray reports, not the big things. Because if you don't supply this required information as indicated, it doesn't mean we'll brush this off as not important and therefore not needed. We need this information to ensure you are medically suitable for this role. It's not just our opinion that your knee or shoulder, etc., are working fabulously okay because you were able to snowboard on the black run last week. We need the medical information to support this. You can send them to us beforehand or you can bring copies on the day. Under the Privacy Act regarding sharing of health information, you are entitled to ha have access to this information to ask your GP or your specialist for copies of these. And if you can't find them at home and there's no blaming mum for not filing them under Sally's medical information in the event she grows up and wants to become a firefighter. You're growing ups now. But also it is a great idea to make an appointment with your specialist or GP for more updated information as we will only be asking you for this on the day. Have a be prepared outlook to this and perhaps avoid snowboarding the week before your medical and definitely only attempt the green runs before you start at the college. I don't, snow I don't ski by the way nor snowboard but okay. <laughs> Uh, make sure this information for lots, lots of reasons. Make sure this information is going to be sent to fire and rescue, not to your GP. So failure to bring this significantly can delay your class, your college class state. Uh, an outcome of your medical fitness can't be finalised until all tests and relevant medical history documentation is submitted. Without the medical component completed, you can't be allocated a spot at the college. I often get asked at this stage of the recruitment process, "Do I have to tell you about my medical condition?" Well, yes, you do, because we're going to notice if you have a third arm and integrity is one of our core values and lying isn't one of them. And if your medical condition is found to be purposely hidden, you would lose your position as a firefighter candidate. There's pathology part of the medical process as well. So you have this um, done as soon as you get the invitation for this and because it takes a couple of days to actually um, get to us as well. And you need about um, to, uh, to fast for 10 hours before you have this test, not like George, George. Yes, George. Um, who, um, who last saw a couple of years ago before he started, he was a bit hungry before he had his fasting blood glucose level, fasting, fasting, Mars bar. Yep, anyway, delayed, <laughs> delayed him starting at the next class, and, uh, but he, he got in at the end, he, he listened. It takes about three days to have these blood tests and ECG, for, oh, and ECG as well, for the information to come to us as well. So you really need to get your timing right. As soon as we say go, 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 go. Um, and you go to your pathologist with our pathology referral for these blood tests, a urine test and an ECG. You don't ask your GP to write these referrals and then claim it to Medicare. We get a lot of, uh, when that happens, we then get a whole lot of results from tests we didn't order. And then we have to take these into account. And it's great you've recovered from your personal infection, possibly associated while snowboarding. But we didn't ask for this and now have to take this into, into account. And you can't claim this to Medicare as Medicare does not cover any payments for pre-employment medicals. These tests can also range in cost between four to six hundred uh, dollars. Um, so your GP doesn't do the medical, doesn't complete the medical assessment. That's when you come to to me and my team. He or she only completes the PAT clearance medical certificate that Mark just previously spoke about. We do the medicals at Fire and Rescue Headquarters at Greenacre. So on the day, you wear your comfortable casual clothing and bring suitable exercise clothing to change into for the examination, including loose sports shorts and for females a sports bra. And when you come to Greenacre headquarters for this, you need to bring, um, you need, sorry, uh, yes, you need to bring all this stuff for your assessment. But you don't have to come dressed in your sports shorts, t-shirt, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. We had one lovely applicant last year from the Blue Mountains who arrived midwinter in shorts and a t-shirt. He didn't even bring a jumper, as we had not literally asked he wear this attire. He was freezing, but we knew he was very good at following instructions. <laughs> Avoid exposure to loud, news, loud noise the day before the musical, uh, for the musical, before the uh, medical. I'll go there later. Enough. Example, rock concert power tools and loud music, unless adequate hearing protection was used. I made a pact with my three daughters, I would not refer to loud music as doof doof music anymore. So if any of you under 25 have a new definition, let me know afterwards, that'd be great. Mm. Click. If, any, uh, if after the initial medical review, you may be asked to provide further information or undergo further assessment. 
costs associated with any additional testing for pre-existing conditions requested by us for the purpose of suitability to the role will in the majority be at your cost. Once the medical component is complete and your criminal check is okay and you haven't murdered granny or driven home drunk from your snowboarding trip, you are successfully employed by Fire and Rescue New South Wales and you'll be now be subjected to periodical health checks. This is new to Fire and Rescue as our duty of care is to maintain the health status you had come, that you had when you came into the job. We are here to support you in every aspect of your health. Fire and Rescue, protecting the irreplaceable, and this now could be you. If you have any concerns or questions regarding a past or present medical condition, please see me after this pres presentation or email Sue at recruitment, because without a full comprehensive medical assessment here in front of the audience today, I can only give you a bit of an idea if there are going to be any issues. But please come and see me afterwards. Thanks very much. Thanks very much to Chrissy and also to Mark for our informative presentations. So if you're lucky enough to get through all of those stages, um, as you would understand, it's a highly sought after public sector role. Uh, around six and a half thousand applicants last year for approximately a uh, hundred positions. So it's, it's, as you know, it's very, very competitive. You would move to the offer of employment, as you can see on the screen. So, uh, and that involves, you, you receive a letter um, offering you a job as a firefighter about seven weeks prior to your allocated recruit class, and you're also asked to go for a uniform fit, start moving through those final stages. Also unsuccessful people will be notified at that point in time. But there is culling along the way, as you'd be aware. So we, we start off with the six and a half thousand, and um, I sort of won't talk about specific numbers, but if you're getting to the medical stage, you can understand that you don't wouldn't want to be discounted through um, you know, minor mistakes that, that Chrissy referred to, not being able to provide documentation, things like that, because you're seriously being considered for employment at that point in time. And once you go to the, the new academy, our academy is at Orchard Hills now. Uh, it's a state-of-the-art uh, setup out there that's got lots of props and objects and um, very experienced trainers out there that will take you through your 13-week program. Uh, during that time, you'll be paid at recruit firefighter rate, and, and once you successfully complete that 13-week program, you'll be given a fire station to report to. Uh, and uh, usually that's in the in the inner city sort of areas or uh, southwest around Ashfield and those sort of areas, generally in the busier fire stations. And you'll be paired up with with some teammates, some colleagues that um, that'll be able to share their wealth of experience with you. So you'll be supported through that that early stages, um, as you will be later on in the organisation as well. So uh, that's. I'll, just want you to touch on the alumni aspects. We still yet. Yeah. So the Fire Rescue New South Wales alumni was was developed in 2011 and assists people with inquiries. So once you get out there as a firefighter in the stations, uh, it can be uh, if if you don't have you know the, the right type of support around you at home or even with the with the groups that you're stationed with, you might feel comfortable talking to people that have come through that are from a similar background to yourself. So. The alumni has been created and you'll be given a contact person that you can speak to that might and you mightn't see on a day-to-day -day basis. They work in a different platoon or in a different area of the state and there's someone that, that you can seek advice from. So, uh, And that'll come through the recruitment team. They'll be happy to answer any of your questions. So I'd like to wish you luck in the, in the process and uh, sort of keep in, in everyone's sight that... Um, you know, it, it's a difficult, complex recruitment process to go through, as you can see, and uh, there's lots of people that, that are successful, not necessarily in their first attempt, but on their, their second, third or fourth attempt. Uh, I went to, when I went to the, the college way back, I had people there that had applied, it was their sixth time applying for, to become a firefighter, and you can imagine how happy they were to, to get in at that particular point. So uh, now we're going to move into question time. So we have, um, we have George and Hugh up there, and we also have Eliza at the back as well. So, um, and, and any, so the, the responding to the questions we shared around amongst the group here. So um, put your hand up if you've got a question, and either George or Hugh or Eliza will come and see you, and we'll get, we'll get going. The back. Uh, 
Are there many people in the Fireys that are asthmatics? Good one for you, Chrissy. Uh, sure. We, um, uh, who am I speaking to? Sorry. Just at the back left oh, up there, hi. yeah. Oh, hi. Um, would you, can you hear me okay if I yep. talk like this? Um, asthma isn't a condition uh, if you're using medication that is, um, is great, um, is, is good for fire and rescue. Um, but let's come and see me afterwards if anybody wants to talk, um, talk um, personally. But unless you're on medication and you're an uh, asthma symptom, um, we won't be it. It's not a, uh, it's not a great thing. <laughs> There is certainly some people that have, it would be fair to say, that, that have, we have had people mild... Tests. We yeah. If you're if you found that you have asthma, we'll, we could, there'll be further tests, like a, what's called a bronchial publication test, and uh, at your cost as well, which would see whether, like, whether you actually, um, uh, whether you respond or not to a, to a drug called Lamitol, to see whether you're actually fit for firefighting duties. But, um, yes, yeah, so childhood asthma will be a test, but if you're currently on medication and have current symptoms, uh, that's not a team to uh, firefighting duties. Hi, I'm Angela. My um, question is more about qualifications to start the process. So I haven't got my HSC, but I'm currently doing a certificate three in the industry that I'm in, which is cleaning. And I'm just wondering if you can apply whilst you're doing the certificate or if you actually have to have completed that before you apply. Would you like to respond to that, Sue? Yeah. Um, you do need to have the I should add also that um, we'll be looking to have recruitments. I can't commit 100% to it, but around this time of year will be when we look to have our permanent firefighter recruitment campaign. So we don't expect to have another campaign before June, July 2020. As you'll note, we had one uh, around six months ago. Uh, but this is the timing that we've, we've hoped to, to maintain. So we, we found that doing the one of the reasons is the physical aptitude tests being conducted in the in the hottest part of summer is quite problematic. So uh, through this campaign, we're looking more around September for the physical aptitude test to be undertaken. So that should um, you know not be quite so testing from a physiological perspective. Sure, down the front here. Um, just one thing for the pat. Um, the one thing that was missed was just the weight on the actual person, so gear. So his gear, how much would that weigh? How you doing? Jordan Kavner. So I say uh, thanks very much. It's uh, been very informative. Um, just uh, kind of two parts here. I'm from Victoria, so we made the way up. And uh, I was just wondering if there's any issues coming interstate? No, no. We've got um, a number of, of employees that, that still live interstate. So I suppose, well, we don't, wouldn't term any of the employees fly in, fly out uh, with 24-hour rostering. Uh, it's certainly a lot easier for people to live significant distances away from their work locations. So there's no hurdles uh, as far as the recruitment goes in that respect. And um, just with the uh, medical assessment for the PAT, is there a standardised kind of uh, form you need to fill out or just a general...? No, it's a standardised form that's sent to you in the candidate PAT. Ah, okay, thank you. Cheers. Get one of the microphones down to you. Just adding to that, just because there's actually information in that pack as well, which shows saying to your GP what a pack is. Yeah. Down the, uh, sorry, there's one down the front here as well. Thanks, mate. Uh, just a quick question with the fire truck as well, do you need prior experience driving trucks for that? 
or are people just required to get a truck license? No, you will just require a commercial driver's license uh, and then you'll be trained in, in driving medium rigid vehicles while you're at the academy. Certainly if you have some experience handling uh, larger vehicles it, it makes that training a little bit easier but, but not a, requ a required aspect. Oh, it's a sure. Where you go. Um, just a follow-up question about the 24-hour roster. Yeah. You're here for one day and then you have 24 hours off and then 24 hours again? That's right. So 0, 0800 hours in the morning is the start of the shift through to 0800 the next morning. Then you're off for 24 hours and start again the following day, 0800 through to 0800 the day after. Right. So for anyone that lives outside of Sydney, is there any um, assistance with accommodation for that day in between or no. any strategies that you guys have to no not really it's reliant on the individual having you know, people that they can stay with in those circumstances so we don't provide anything as far as accommodation goes in that respect but there is opportunities to move to outer parts of um you know there's often hard to fill roles out in regional new south wales as well we're often looking for people to move to so there may be some opportunities there if the right location came up um, yeah, during your term as a firefighter. Sure. Um, if you were successful through the processes, what is the kind of time frame from, so like from start to finish? Like when would you potentially start the 13 week? Yeah, that can be varied. I'll, um, you, want, you want to answer that, Sue? Potentially 32, we're yeah. We're not quite sure what the class size is. Um, so, but we'll, if you're in the process, we'll send you emails approximately once a month mm -hmm. just to make sure, you know, you're not forgotten. And uh, because we usually allocate the classes and then people get about seven weeks notice. So you could be in a class October 2020 that you're applying there. Yeah, you know okay. I mean? It's not yeah. all of that year. Yeah, yeah. of course. We'll also look to have, um, you know, sort of a diverse breakdown of, of backgrounds in each of the classes as well, so we don't have just... Uh, we, we are doing a, a retained class in October, so people that have been retained firefighters that have been successful through the permanent firefighter campaign. One of our aims in, in through that process is to try and have them, because they, they hold a lot of the competencies already that you need to have as a, as a firefighter, so we're hoping that we can have a, a shortened time, shorter than the 13 weeks at the academy. So um, while some of them you know, would have liked to be in the early classes straight after the last campaign, they won't be starting till October and, and then you know, we'll see how that process goes. We've got um, RTO uh, requirements and, and, and ASCA standards quality assurance process to go through to make sure that our, our um, you know, graduates out of the academy uh, have been assessed at an appropriate level and hold all those units of competency to go out as a firefighter, which means they have transferable skills to be able to move into state, um, dependent on the programs. Not all organisations do lateral transfer, but um, if the skills are recognised nationally, it gives them a better chance of applying for roles in other states if that's something that they would like to do. Um, just on that question as well, sorry, I'm over here. Yeah. <laughs> um, just on that question as well, with the classes, is is it just random allocation for candidates into the classes or is it based on skill level or...? Yeah, do you want to address that, Sue? Uh, no, it's definitely random uh, selection for each recruit class. Uh, sometimes we get you know, some special requests from candidates, for example, if they're in the Defence Force and they have to give a, a certain so we will accommodate requests like that. Other people are, you know, maybe going, getting married or all sorts of stories. So we try to, you know, accommodate requests. Uh, and that's why we give people seven weeks notice. But if you can't, um, for whatever reason, take up that offer within that period, then we'll put you on a later class. You won't miss out. Lady in the blue jacket, yes. Um, I was wondering if there'd be another opportunity to do the... Um, uh, pat testing of the apparatuses, like having a go at them. 
Um, yeah, so I did the Wafa day, so I got an advantage of doing that. But would there be another sure, opportunity one you, to try? As part of the recruitment process proper, every candidate has to testify for that stage and needs to do an induction. We, we, you, you then can't tell uh, Fire and Rescue New South Wales that we didn't give you every opportunity to interact with the gear, understand our moves, test out that freight mechanism that I was banging on about a lot. Um, but certainly in terms of helping with uh, people coming through in the future, we're working with recruitment on various education sessions being made available, as well as those uh, training videos that I've talked about as well. In the watch shirt, you had a question? Yeah, yeah. I was just wondering, um, what's the rules and regulations on tattoos, because I'm looking around, no one here has any visible or big ones, and I'm going to sleep, so I'm wondering if it's going to hold them. <coughs> I don't think there's any... No. <laughs> no, I don't believe there's any restrictions around... Um, yeah. Does Mo know you or does he, is he... Is he basing it on the tattoo or...? <laughs> no, there's nothing that... No. Yeah. And... Uh, while you're undergoing the training, it's pretty intensive. So a certain, you know, if, you, if you're not doing face-to-face -face sessions and you're just doing some online work and, and, and assignments and those type of things, it's possible. But there is, it's a huge commitment when you're at the college and it's very draining. Sorry, at the academy, I should say. Um, so you, you're there Monday to Friday and you have work to do outside of the classroom as well. So it's probably not recommended, but if you're just looking for a, you know, a period of, of being able to, to put some of your, your university training on hold in that time and just maybe doing a little bit, that's probably possible. When you get out to a, to a fire station, you'll certainly have time on your days off to, to attend to other studies as well. We've had a few people, uh, I, I think uh, George or Hughes currently involved in some university studies at the moment. We even have examples of, um, you might remember Steve Middleton who you know, did a medical degree while he was a firefighter and um, so he's probably in the fire, brigade, fire rescue New South Wales for about oh, 11 years or something like that around there and for seven or eight of them he was doing his medical degree and then graduated and he ended up leaving our organisation but you know it was hard for him to leave because he loved being a firefighter, he just had a, a greater passion for, for being a doctor so he's, he's gone on his way. Thank you. Um, if one is successful in passing the PAT and the medical and everything else and progresses to the training or has made an offer of employment, yeah. is any of the training recognised if, um, if one comes from another emergency service? Yeah, so we have, um, I won't call it recognition of prior learning, it's recognition of, of prior service. So we have, a, one is our retained staff, so when retained staff uh, join the organisation, not so much in the, the RPL space, though there, though there is some things being developed that will allow us for to sort of acknowledge and utilise their units of competency. If they've had four years as a retained firefighter, they get a, a year, a quarter of that, so one year cut off their progression periods for qualified firefighter or senior firefighter, so a, a shortened time frame, as long as they do all their required units of competency within that time. Uh, same goes for people coming from another urban fire service. So we've had people that have come from the Northern Territory in South Australia, and if they've had sort of five years over there, they get reduced time frames to progress through the ranks after they provide the evidence that show us that they've been able to, you know, been involved in regular training and, and response uh, to structure fires and, and other types of rescue incidents within that time. Uh, my question is just in regards to the online testing in the first stage. Uh, I said it last year, so I heard you said before that the results will carry over because it was in the 12-month period. Um, but with that emotional intelligence test changing, will I get the opportunity to sit the new one or does the scores carry over from last year's? Then you'll be able to sit the new test because it's different. Thank you.
Yeah, for that to apply, it has to be the, the same specific test. And there is some, while, there, while a motor fire and mesquite are testing similar attributes, they're, they're done through a different process. So there's a requirement to, to sit that other one. So if you didn't do great last time, you'll do better this time, I'm sure. Um, I moved to Australia nine years ago and I just been granted with my citizenship and uh, all my degrees are done overseas, like uh, uni, high school. Uh, am I able to apply for the job if I translate all those diplomas that I've got? Okay, thank you. That was Sue's opportunity to get the plug in for the website too, so well done. <laughs> <laughs> Any more up that end? No? Yeah? So you have experience with firefighting and you've got qualifications like K and firefighting experience. Would that help you progress in any way to the firefighting? It's certainly a benefit if you're familiar with those types of um, you know, processes and standard operational procedures that we utilise you know, from a safety perspective but they don't um, sort of uh, annul your need to still go through that, that training as a group. Because as you'd understand, there's still some benefits in that group progressing through together. You know, say it's a group of 16 recruits. Um, you know, having some people sit aside and not participate in the group training sort of has a, has a negative sort of social effect anyway. So, um, you know, despite your experience, it would be considered that you have to participate in, in all the things that the other recruits do. So oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, yep. Yes. Yep. Cool. In terms of where you ultimately might be allocated, um, yeah. you know, a station down the line, is there any preference given to people with families, for instance, kids? Things like that? In the recruitment process? No, in terms of where you ultimately might be allocated as your, your station. Where you so, yeah, well, what happens is um, we get, or, or one of my areas gets given the request from the zone commanders who, who have their specific areas like, say, Ashfield or CBD area uh, of vacancies that they want filled from the recruit classes. So we then liaise with the trainers who observe you over your training and, and also you, if you've got a, a brother or a sister or a father or a relative in the job, what platoon they might be in. So you try and match up. You, know, you might say if you've got a brother on B platoon and you want to be on the same platoon as them. I was referring more to if you have children of your own in terms of proximity to you know, being close to family. Not really, okay. no, because, I mean, we could give some consideration, but there's only the vacancies that are given to us. So the requests come, they're the jobs that we have to fill, uh, but some people would be deemed to be more suited to a busy station like City of Sydney uh, rather than a quieter station and things like that. So we're, it's based on how many vacancies come to us. Um, with the at the academy, when you if you get through to that the training portion yeah. of it, what kind of hours? You said Monday to Friday, but what kind of hours? I'm assuming long. Yeah, it's uh, it's a similar to a special roster, so zero eight hundred to to four thirty p.m. each day. Uh, but then while you're there, there might be some needs to start a little bit early. But that's that's the rough core hours, oh eight hundred to four thirty p.m. Okay, thank you. Sorry, yes. Uh, two questions. How often is the recruitment period? Is it like yearly or is it every couple months or what's that like? For these campaigns, permanent firefighter campaign? Yeah. So we're aiming for around um, 12 months. That's what we'd like to do. Uh, this one's shorter based on a, a number of factors that I, that I won't go into, but one of them is the, is the uh, people uh, conducting the physical aptitude testing in the, in the hottest part of the year. So we really did want to bring that forward to a, to a springtime. So, you know, at the moment we would expect that we'll recruit again around June, July 2020. And what, are there any type of um, other courses or qualifications that would be good to have in, 
in recruitment or prior to or anything that could help really? Yeah. Thank you. Is there any age restrictions and also how hard it is how hard is it to get back out to regional areas? Like I've just flown in from Port Macquarie today and based on the family question from just before, like I've I've got a young family back there. Yep. So there's no age limit on, on applications. Uh, and we've had uh, one of our recent graduates, actually his daughter was a firefighter and, and he uh, was successful in, I don't, it wasn't the last campaign, might have been the one before. So that was an interesting story. Uh, obviously 25 years apart in age and, and he saw her get in and thought that he would love to. I think he may have actually been an applicant in the, the campaign that, that she went through and she was successful and, and then he was successful in the next one. Um, it's complex as far as movements go because there's areas like the Northern Rivers, say, and Wollongong that are highly sought after and we have 10 year waiting list for people to get stationed down into those areas and, and up to the Northern Rivers. So those ones are difficult. Uh, in regional New South Wales, there's a number of stations that would be considered hard to fill. So over the last couple of years, we've uh, done direct recruitment to places like Moree, Broken Hill, um, Cessnock, Maitland, a few of those stations. But a lot of them are under a different roster as well. So the 24 hour roster doesn't apply to, to those stations. Um, Maitland and Cessnock, they work Monday to Friday, which um, for some people is not as attractive. So um, yeah, but there, there is opportunities, but if you live in Port Macquarie and you just want to work, work in Port Macquarie, there's a fair chance you'll be waiting many, many years to get stationed there. So there's regular recruitment for retained, for retained or on-call firefighters. Uh, that's on a needs basis. It's sort of rolling recruitment across the state. And, uh, and it's just as vacancies occur in each of those stations. So sort of keep your eye on social media for any specific stations. A lot of stations have got their own Facebook pages now. So there's an opportunity to, to have a look around for those and, and keep your eye. If you're interested in some you know, specific stations, uh, hook up with them on social media and, and look for the, the flags of when they are recruiting. Yes. Um, so I have a question about like the rostering in the day-to-day -day life of a firefighter. My mum is a nurse and I know that every couple of weeks like she goes on call for weekends and so she'll still work her regular roster but then she'll also be on call ready to respond if they have an emergency. As a firefighter like working a 24-hour roster or whatever, do you have times where you're called to an emergency situation and you, you just got to be ready for it? Sure, someone, one yeah. of the... So, um, firstly, we have things, well, just getting back to bait, we have overtime, so we'll go on a database, you go onto the computer, make your availability known. So, like, I'm on annual leave, but these are my days off if I was at work. So, just so I'm off Monday to Thursday, I can create my availability on the hours that suit myself. And if a region within a specified kilometre radius would require someone, they look at that and the least hour person will get first stabs at the overtime. And in regards to incidents and things like that, our communication centre, from what I understand, on a shift that's off duty, they'll send out a generic text message that there's been a major, i.e. the hail storms you might get, um, that's probably the biggest one in December and January, they send out a generic text message, you reply yes or no, and then within five minutes or so, they'll get back to you and say, yeah, um, commence duty 0800 hours, uh, hypothetically report to Green Acre and you'll either get on a bus or a truck or anything like that and go out and be deployed somewhere to render assistance. All right, thanks. OK, last question up the back. Uh, do I need a swimming certificate uh, to apply to join the fire brigade? A swimming certificate. Swimming certificate. No. No. It's not part of the, no, it's not part of the essential criteria. So I'd like to, um, to thank all the people that have helped out in the background, James and Sebastian as well, as well as Eliza, George and Hugh, and of course to our 
illustrious group at the front here and also our recruiters and Mark, Chrissy and Sue. Thanks very much. And most of all, I want to thank all of you for, for being here today and wish you luck in the process.